This episode of JJ Meets World is brought to you by Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Realty. Natalie has a proven track record to get your home sold faster and for more money. She is consistently focused on her clients' needs and wants throughout the entire process and make sure that they are well taken care of. If you're looking to buy or sell, reach out to Natalie today. On average, Natalie sells a home every 3.74 days. That's at least two a week. And last year, Natalie earned her clients on average over $4,000 above list price on their homes. And you don't have to take our word for it. Here's some of the great reviews Natalie has received. I was overwhelmingly impressed with Natalie and all the Hatch team. She was very responsive and responded to all of the emails within an hour. She gave great advice and encouragement from the listing and pictures, the offer, and all the closing details. The marketing team knew exactly how to promote my property, and I was pleased by how soon and easily my property received an offer. I was actually dreading selling my condo, and Natalie did such an awesome job that I felt like I really didn't need to do anything. The thing I most appreciated was that she really listened to what I wanted to do and respected my my decisions. I would definitely recommend Natalie and all the Hatch Realty team. They made this process so wonderful. That was from Diane. So listen, if you're in the mood to buy or sell a home, give Natalie a call right now. You can reach her at 701-388-9338. Natalie, N-A-T-A-L-I-E at HatchRealtyFM.com. Or you can go to LiveFargoMoorhead.com. That's Live. FargoMoorhead.com and find out some information. Huge thanks to Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Realty for sponsoring JJ Meets World. Well, how's it going, podcast listeners? I'm an old timey silver miner, and this is my favorite podcast. Oh, today's guest is Linda Boyd. You probably know her from the Symphony or being on the Fargo City Commission or many other great things. Plus, J.J. talks about his favorite television show, Down Nabby. I don't know what a television is, but I'm going to go down into this mine. Hope this canary doesn't die. Patreon.com slash J.J. Meets World. One, two, three, four. J.J. Gordon, sort of like that Indiana Jones in that he's always snipping out his next adventure. Yes, he is. He's always interviewing guests so he can have them on his show and they can talk about pop culture, arts, and leisure. J.J. has his flag unfurled and he likes his french fries curled and he's fun and then he twirls as he goes to meet the world. He will march into the rain even if his ankle sprain. Take a peek inside his brain. This podcast is called J.J. Meets World. Name a room that a house would have to have to be considered a mansion. A library. Ooh, a library. Okay. I was thinking uh, something like uh, like a billiard room. Or probably like servants' quarters. Oh. Servants' quarters would probably be it. Because if you have a mansion, a legit mansion, I think you have staff for your home. Who are running it for you. Yeah. Do you ever watch any Downton Abbey? No. I loved Downton Abbey. And here, let me tell you the top 10 reasons I like Downton Abbey. Number one, the butler, Mr. Carson, he he wasn't going to accept any crap from, from anybody. Did you say top 10 reasons? Top 10 reasons. Good. So that's right. number let's, one. Let's go. Uh, number two, the wisdom of Mrs. Hughes. Oh, well, she was a smart, smart lady. Number three, they uh, the dog was named Isis, and then they had to kill off the dog because they couldn't continue to say Isis and how great it was. Uh Number three, Thomas. Four. No, that, oh, that's four. Number four, <laughs> Thomas Barrow. You Mr. Look at Barrow. his hand to double check. <laughs> it's like the pinky's not up. Uh, was one is one of the greatest villains of all time, and they wanted you to make like feel for him, but he was just a super awful guy. Number five, when they go to Dun Eagle up in Scotland, they've got this giant circle of like shotguns that is over the fireplace. It is one of the coolest accent pieces I've ever seen. As just like a prop in a movie, number it's six. A TV show, but okay. Well, I yeah, I guess, but it's gonna be a movie soon. Like maybe by the time of this podcast, I just airing. like pointing out your flaws. Keep yep. going. Number six, uh, the the town Ripon that they constantly go to seems to be like a pretty happening place, but not as much as London. So it's sort of like if you lived in Valley City and you went to either Jamestown or Fargo. <laughs> number seven, Uh Mr. Bates is so mysterious, and we're all agreed that he actually did kill his wife, right? Like, we're all on the same page. Number eight. 
my robot vacuum Roomba is named Carson after the <laughs> butler, the butler, Mr. Carson, even though I know he never actually cleans anything. You but better I just have to explain that, that too to people. It's not Carson Wentz. It's it's the butler from right. Downton Abbey. Yeah. In fact, a lot. most of my friends don't ask, is that named after Carson Wentz? But that has come up from strangers, a.k.a. Uh, the guy who's delivering our UPS package, and it actually drove out of the house. <laughs> well, you're like, Carson, get back door. here. Yeah. Uh, number nine, the fact that, like, in the very first episode, Lady Mary has to carry a dead body down the hallway, and then they really never take, like, talk about it again, the fact that she handled a corpse. They talk about how unsullied, you know, she, or how sullied she was after she slept with a man who wasn't her husband, not the fact that they hid and moved a dead body. And number 10, for reasons why I love the show Downton Abbey, is the magic of that era. So the very first episode is like when the Titanic sinks, mm. and it carries you all the way through World War One, and it was just such a cool time to watch little advancements, like when the county fair comes and they've got steam-powered uh, merry-go-rounds and stuff like that. I just, I just really... I enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. Um, speaking of a lot of fun, uh, our conversation today with Linda Boyd is very intriguing, especially for those of you who are in the nonprofit world, the arts world. Uh, Linda has always been just an amazing human being, uh, especially to the folks in Fargo, especially to the folks in the arts world. We touch on her work with the symphony, going back not once but twice to be the executive director. We talk about being on this task force to look for a brand new uh, performing arts center that could be located in Fargo. We talk about her political years. We even talk about how she got into hockey. I even tell her how I eat chicken strips in the shower. That yeah. was her favorite part, yeah. for sure. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. In fact, she gave you the hand, like the stop hand. She did. Uh, <laughs> That, that only so, goes me on more, Linda. So Linda can come back anytime that she wants because she can put <laughs> Tucker in his place. Uh, strap in, folks. This episode of JJ Meets World uh, with Linda Boyd. And while you're strapping in, why not head over to patreon.com slash JJ Meets World and donate to this podcast. JJ Meets World. Linda Boyd, welcome to JJ Meets World. We're excited to have you. Thank you. This is fun to be here. So first and foremost, my introduction to you as a citizen of Fargo was a person who was getting active in politics who gave a voice to folks in the arts community, <laughs> which really didn't exist uh, on a you know on a city commission level. And so I've always really respected you a oh, lot you. for that. Uh, why a passion uh, for the arts and giving that a voice? Well, it was interesting. I was one of those people who would be, I was somewhat interested in politics, you know, reading the paper, yelling at the TV, that sort of thing. And uh, years ago in 2003, 2004, Arlette Preston and Jean Rail took me out to lunch and said, we think you should consider running for city commission and we'll help you with your campaign. They had both been on the commission. Um, Jean was going to be retiring and uh, not running again. And they thought it was important to have a woman on the commission and it wasn't something I had ever considered. And so um, it was great. Arlette ran my campaign. I got on the commission and that uh, it's such an interesting position to be in, first of all. Uh, I kind of like it, certainly, I think, more than I would enjoy being on the North Dakota legislature because <laughs> you just have to talk to other people into voting with you, and you can get a lot done. <laughs> yep. It's nice. So, And you can also see that directly yes, and pretty quickly, just too. there it is. And so that was that was fantastic. Um, I really enjoyed serving. My portfolio was pretty challenging. I had all the community develop development, planning, social issues. So the homeless shelter... Uh, Gladys Ray Shelter, the library, uh, some various developments, those were all on my plate. So that I got nicknamed by the folks who worked in City Hall at the time, the uh, grenade girl. It's like, how far can she carry this grenade down the field till it blows up? That was my job. Well, that's a pretty, that's a pretty awesome nickname to have, I, the grenade I girl. Like it, yeah. That might be our episode title. I don't know. <laughs> I like it. Um and, you know, one other thing I've noticed, too, is you're somebody who has the the ability to have plain speaking. 
So hmm. I noticed that you don't uh, use 50 words if five will do to make a point, which well, I I'm also appreciate tell... as a citizen. Thank you for that. I'm going to tell Sarah in our office because I'm known around there as the one who uses way, 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 way too many words. Oh, but really? when I'm writing and describing something or I'm designing a poster and it's like, that's just too busy. <laughs> Yeah. Stop it. I would love to hear a podcast with you and Carrie Winterstein called Too Many Words. Oh my goodness. When <laughs> Too we many get, words. Oh, when we get together, <laughs> it's it's bad news. And uh so it, I also will say too, like I love having uh at least one woman, if not more, on the city commission. We're missing that right now, which are. is uh unfortunate. Uh and not because it's just important that we uh build up uh women in politics, but perspective is huge and it is the the perspective i think of my sister and i raised in the exact same household we have completely different perspectives because our lives are completely different from one another right even though the you know the roots are all the same the tree has diverged in different Mm -hmm. directions and so i always think when she and i are planning something together i'm so thankful that i've got this other person and i've got this other perspective that she can bring to it Mm -hmm. um what uh, uh, what was it like uh, being, uh, you know, uh, working for the library? Because you would have been there during the time the library was saying, like, we need to remodel and yeah, rebuild. Yeah, th- the way that uh, happened was right when I came on the commission, it was the same time that Mike Williams did. And he, he kind of had a, <laughs> I swear, a master plan in his head. Uh, but one of them was to uh, promote a sales tax for the library. Uh, the library ended up being in my portfolio as well as a commissioner. And so the election was in June, came on the commission. By September, we were taking a vote. I ended up being the one actually designing the campaign. So, you know, that we've outgrown the library. So at the time, uh, my daughter uh, was in high school. And so I had her ask uh, her classmate, um, Mike Dawson, Tom Dawson, or hmm. Uh, no, uh, my my it, second cousin Alex or Mike Dawson. Mike Dawson. Mike. Yep, yep. Uh, to come over to a photography studio, I brought some of my son's clothes. My son was six years younger than Keith or than than uh, Mike Dawson, and so he put on these little clothes, these clothes that were way too small for him. Sat in this little chair, and we took a photo, and that was the campaign, and so that you know, we've outgrown our library, and the vote past i was chair of the building committee and so i really was lucky fortunate to have that position to see the whole project through so new main library two new branch libraries on budget on time so let's uh, transition to this music is a big part of your life huh yes so tell us how you (laughs) tell us how where the passion for music comes from and the things that you've been excited about well i was just a music nerd growing up that kind of I thought that was going to be my path. Actually, I was trying to d- decide between three things when I was in high school, if I was going to go into music, if I was going to go into art, or be an attorney. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, ah. um, yeah. So It all makes more sense now. <laughs> well, I don't know, because when they have career day at your school, you know, I signed up for music because that was really the only thing I was interested in. I didn't know if there was a, a career option. So I put that down. And then I put art down because I really enjoyed that too. And you had to fill in three things. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I looked at the list. I thought, well, being an attorney sounds kind of interesting because I like to argue. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I went to that and instantly I realized, oh my goodness, that is not for me. It's like really boring, a lot of research, very detail oriented. And it's like, nope. So went to school for music at Morehead State. Dropped out after three years, joined a band, then ended up back in my hometown, managed a Radio Shack store, was a sales and catering worker at a hotel, bartended. <laughs> it's like, I got to come back to school. So then I finished up and got I'll my say, master's. That sounds exactly like what I imagine someone who, zagging, who goes yeah. into a band uh, who ends up doing, uh, managing a Radio Shack. Yeah. Um, <laughs> As Which, by does. the way, I am <laughs> I'm bummed that Radio Shack is gone. Radio Shack once a year would well, always come and help me out. I could with give something you some insight as to what that might be, but <laughs> yeah. okay. But I really did like all the different connections I a could go diodes buy. Yeah, and, I needed. Oh I actually needed them, but you have to Amazon it now. Yeah, yeah. 
I know you're kind. Yeah. We're always needing <laughs> that to guy. reconnect cables to stuff. And... You come in with your little thing. Where, where do I find this on the whole wall of yep. diodes? And yep. I was the nerd to help you find it. <laughs> My favorite thing was to come in and take a piece of outdated technology that I needed to hook up to current technology and be like, how many adapters can I hook together to make this work with something? And it, I never left unsatisfied. <laughs> I will say, though, every time I went to a Radio Shack, the first thing I heard out of the employee's mouth was, <sighs> every single time. Yep. I was like, I get it. We both are unhappy that we're in a radio shack right now. But let's <laughs> let's get this going. Let's be done with this. So uh music with you today. Uh yep. So it's been interesting that I've been able to have music as part of my career in some way or the other throughout my life. Um I've been a teacher, a voice teacher, opera director choir director, composer, um, but where I really found my place was in nonprofit administration. So my first job at that was as the executive director of what's now the Arts Partnership. Back then it was known as Lake Agassiz Arts Council. Uh, the position of executive director of the symphony opened up in uh, 1993. So that was my dream job. I applied for that and, and got it. So I worked there from 93 to 96. Uh, at the same time, my ex-husband was kind of finishing his time at Moorhead State. He helped uh, put the music industry program together. Mm -hmm. So we, Which, started... by the way, is booming now. Yeah, it is yeah, amazing. It is. In fact, I think well, they, they call it the EIT now, the Entertainment yeah, Industry they have and a Technology. Whole different, uh, career path. Or, or, it's just amazing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> But we started a recording studio, and it ended up being pretty all-consuming, so I left my job at the symphony to do that, which is not exactly what I anticipated. But I got to do graphic design and producing and arranging, you know, I'd say I need a, <laughs> I need a string quartet arrangement, kind of like George Martin by Tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Piece of cake. So those, those kinds of things were fun. But um, so then when the symphony... So as things kind of unfolded, uh, the symphony approached me in 2007 to come back. They'd gone through some uh, leadership changes. And so I've been back at the symphony as executive director since 2007. And it's it's still my dream job. I love it so much. I get to do all sorts of different things. And, and it's a great organization. And the symphony has changed so dramatically in its public perception since that time with things like the symphony rocks out of blue yeah. stem. I remember the first year I was like, oh, that sounds kind of fun. And I went to go buy a ticket and they're like, no, no we're, <laughs> we're sold out. <laughs> that thing has started selling out the past few years. So it's great. Which is really yeah, amazing. It's great. Well, that had an interesting uh, origin. When I came back to the symphony of 2007, it's like when you come into any organization, whether it's like you're an elected official or, or you're new on the job or coming to an organization, all the people who've had these pent up ideas are just waiting for the new guy to spring them on because <laughs> maybe they were told no by the old guy. So uh, one of the first things that happened was Russ Peterson from Post Traumatic Funk Syndrome and our principal bassoonist teaches at Concordia. He had the idea of doing a gig with his band and the symphony. And the biggest challenge with that is a venue. And at the time, if you remember when The Hub and the venue mm -hmm. were going. Uh, we crammed everybody on that stage in, I think it was 2008, and did the first Symphony Rocks in there. And it, was, it wasn't ideal. It was tough. It was, it was a fun gig. Uh, so we kind of put that in, in the back of our, uh, kind of on the back burner. And then when Blue Stem was built, that made it possible to do that gig again because it takes a big stage <laughs> sound is very complicated but um in the meantime we had as the symphony's major fundraiser the symphony ball which mm -hmm. was kind of this annual gala 52 years that thing had gone on in the beginning it was the uh social event of the year for this whole community and that always sold out and and as the years went on and generations kind of came and went, it got to the point where we were, I remember a board meeting in September and 
were like, come on, board members, you know, reserve a table, talk to your friends to go. And I had one board member that said, I would pay $200 not to go to the ball. It's like, oh, wow, we're done. Mm -hmm. (laughs) This thing is over. (laughs) So we, we made the move to discontinue the symphony ball, which, you know, this big tradition, and do symphony rocks instead. And so it turned out to be a great move. Now, instead of 200 people kind of griping because the party's not fancy enough. <laughs> now we have uh, 2,000 people seeing what the symphony's all about, having a great time. And, uh, and it's all, all ages. All ages, absolutely. So that's been a very fun move. You know, but it's willingness a- to change is kind of one thing I appreciate about that organization um, that I... I think in terms of staff, board, musicians, that's part of what runs through that organization is a real willingness to, all right, let's give it a shot. Let's Which try it. Which is amazing because so many other organizations, we've seen them come and go in Fargo who just dug in their heels and they were not willing to change and they were not willing to accept the fact that, well, you know, we've been doing this for 52 years. We're going to do it for another 52 <laughs> years, no matter how many people show up. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, that had to be kind of a terrifying thing for for the symphony to give up the symphony ball. But at the same time, there are more nonprofits vying for those same oh dollars in Fargo-Moorhead than there has ever been before. Well, and it's challenging for the arts because if you look at the pyramid, you know, the and this is nationwide, the the big chunk of the pyramid at the bottom, you know, the, the bottom two chunks are typically education and religion. So people give to their alma mater, people give to their church. Those are huge. And then as it goes up the pyramid and narrows as you get, you know, social needs and and rescue this and homeless. I mean, you know, those those basic, basic human needs uh get a lot of the philanthropic dollars and then you get up to the little tippy top of the pyramid and that's what the arts get in terms of the philanthropic dollars and that really holds true in this community we are fortunate to have wonderful supporters of the symphony but it's always a challenge i mean we (laughs) we struggle every week every year Mm -hmm. we've had to cut some things because of funding um my saying was always, it's never the art that burns you out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know? oh, yeah, that's completely true. That's, 100% true. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's a challenge, and it, it gets more challenging every year. If, you know, the symphony seems like it's this, well, it is, it's this 88-year organization and kind of this big traditional ship of state, you know. Well, no, we're <laughs> very small but mighty staff, you know, working like hell under the water, you know. It's like the duck. Yeah, kind everything is cool on the surface, yeah, and like, underneath what? you're paddling like crazy. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, I also find that people confuse supporting the arts with their presence uh, with supporting it in other ways. So they think, sure. well, I, I went to the symphony mm-hmm. twice this year, so I, you know, I don't need to think about them on Giving Hearts Day because they, I already, they already got my admission yep. fee. Yep, yep. I bought a ticket, and that's great because that's one of our income streams, of course, is ticket revenue, and. We understand that before someone gives you an additional dollar, they have to love you. You know, you give what you, you give to what you love. And so it's really important that people show up and understand what it's like to be in a room where 80 human beings right in front of you are making this incredible music. It's just such a powerful experience. And so if we can get people excited about that experience and wanting to seek it out, then you know, the, the ask for the additional dollars comes later. Once they want to see this continue, they understand how important it is. It's an expensive art form. You know, we pay all the musicians for all the rehearsals and performances and soloists and I remember my rental. dad telling me, because my mom got us tickets to go see a symphony event when I was in my teens, where did you grow up? Where was this? I, I was right here in Fargo. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, I was okay. a Fargo South grad, oh, you know, cool. 2002. Woo woo. Uh, and uh, Fargo we, North. We, we oh, went. stop it, you guys. Not Blue Jay. We had one high school. <laughs> we went to this event, and I remember my dad kind of griping, being like, ah, you know, I go to JJ's band concert already. <laughs> 
And afterwards, he said something that was that I have remembered ever since, which she goes, you know, you go and you see something like a high school band concert, and you're going there because you're supporting your kid who's out there. Seeing something of that quality versus professional musicians is it's not even it's not even apples and oranges. Yeah, it's like it's, oh. it's like apples and jet fuel, you know, yeah. two things that you can't compare at all. And there's a sports analogy in there, right? Like you watch your kid play football, it's different than going to a Vikings game. It is right. And there probably is that one kid who could end up being in the Vikings mm-hmm. one day. Right. And or you know, for us it was probably uh Ross Peterson, who is no related to Russ yeah. Peterson, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. his dad's name is also Russ. For us it was Madeline Capistran. Yeah. She yeah. was yes. Madeline. That, that, she was yeah. from Fargo North. Well, and they come through, and Madeline has played in the symphony. And well, Haley Pullen making, too, and uh, Haley, who's, yeah, uh, in, yeah, yeah, Haley's amazing. She's a bassoonist, and she's making her living in Europe playing period instruments. You know, the Baroque bassoon. Really? Yeah. See, yeah. which amazing. is funny because I remember how much she would complain about bassoon rehearsal back in high school, <laughs> but she worshipped Russ too. I mean, that's how I got to know Russ. Yeah, about but Russ otherwise Peterson. she's a pretty smart girl. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So do you do you find that there are people out there who still have that stigma of like, ugh, that's the it's the symphony. I'm gonna the you know, the people who are like I'd rather give you money so I don't have right, to go to right, right. you know sit through this concert. You know, I think that's something that we're really intentional about going after all the time. You know, when Chris and I plan programs, I tell him every time so that he's sick of hearing it. There's going to be newcomers at every single concert, so the program has to be something that. If this is your first time in a concert hall, it's going to knock you out. You might not have heard it before. You might not, you know, it might be all new to you, but we have to really program with that in mind. The coolest thing that's going to happen this weekend. So as we're recording this, my concerts are tonight and tomorrow, Saturday evening and Sunday afternoon. I've got my tickets. I know it's going to be great. The mythical heroes and women warriors. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking, you know, we're always thinking of how we can reach out to other groups, not just to turn them into ticket buyers and donors, but to just spread that experience as, because we exist for the community. And so I met Adam Martin of the F5 project when mm-hmm. I was running for city commission this Previous last time. Previous guest on JJ Meets World. Yep. Yep. He's, he's amazing. And I thought this concert would be perfect for his guys yeah. They're, they're kind of heroes to turn their lives around. So I asked if I could come talk to one of his house meetings. So that was a few weeks ago on a Sunday. And uh, so they were all gathered around. I walked in and, and uh, showed the poster, talked about what the concert was going to be like, uh, asked how many people had ever been to a symphony concert because I didn't want to be talking down to anybody. And there were a handful of people who raised their hands. And I kind of described what the experience was like and they said I want you to come as our guests so we have 15 people from the F5 project coming to the concert I said you don't have to dress up any of you could wear what you're wearing right now you can dress up if you if you want to and so if you go to a concert you'll see some people kind of making a, a a date night out of it and they're a little spiffed up you see some people just coming in jeans and a sweater whatever and uh it's all about experiencing music together whenever you guys do something in the presbyterian church is also one of my absolute favorite yeah moments we do our too. holiday brass concert in there and it's just oh, gorgeous so powerful yeah so powerful and you know you you mentioned chris too chris zimmerman uh yes. who is your conductor mm-hmm. i had the pleasure of interviewing him uh not so long ago on my day job sure and he mm. always wants to come on that show by the way oh really he will nag you oh good fantastic well he can be on anytime he wants All the, right. the accent really gets people He's to turn so up their uh, radios a little bit so here's the deal so Christopher Zimmerman our music director um, the way our organization works is if the concert's on Saturday night the rehearsals start the previous Sunday so we have one compressed week of rehearsals every every night um so he flies in, he lives in Washington, D.C. area, and he's also the director of the Fairfax Symphony in Fairfax, Virginia. So when, when he gets a concert review for his other gig, it's in the Washington Post. <laughs> okay. So, but, that doesn't so that's cool. have as much weight as the Fargo Forum? Well, or? I don't know. It depends. It depends. Um, so when our previous conductor let us know that that was going to be his final three-year contract, whatever, Bernie Rubenstein, he was going to retire. So we started this, it's almost a three-year process to do a conductor search, because first you 
kind of do an assessment of where you are and who are we looking for? What do we want? You know, you put that out there. We got 104, 140 applications from conductors all over the world. So it takes a while to boil those down and, you know, do some phone interviews of the finalists. And then we have an entire season, uh, conductor search season, where the five finalists come in and each one of them conducts one of the concerts that season. And during the week that they're here, we put them through a lot of stuff. They have to give an address at a Rotary Club. They have to give a talk on music and technology at Microsoft. And they all ask me, well, what's that about? It's like, I don't know, you tell me. And part of us to see what they come up with. Um, and they had to take a junior high orchestra rehearsal um, just to see how they react in a really unfamiliar yeah. setting. You're seeing you how, know? They, how they experience Absolutely. the community yep, like as yep. a whole. Meet with donors and social events and so forth. So Chris really emerged as not only the favorite of the various groups, but the musicians were very strongly behind him. And he's, so he's originally from London. He hasn't lost one bit of that accent, I swear. And so he's got that kind of charming thing going for him. But the other thing about Chris is that he's kind of no filter. And you get that when you're talking to him and he kind of blurts stuff at times and you think, wow, he's just (laughs) <laughs> he's just right there and he's like that as a conductor and our musicians just play their brains out for him they just you can see it you can feel it when he is in front of that orchestra that they're just he's pulling everything they have uh it's it's fantastic it's amazing it's, yeah and he's just such a cool guy in fact when uh when i was chatting with him i shared one of my favorite quotes it comes from a conductor and he's a uh, conducting a piece with a with an orchestra uh, who's played this, this particular piece a dozen times. Sure. It's something that they play every year for this this concert. and They're just kind of just going through the motions, and it sounds wonderful, but it doesn't sound amazing. It's not life-changing, yeah. and he stops. He says, everyone, could I, could I please just have a moment of your time, and I'd, I'd like you to think of two people in the audience. There will be someone here tonight who hears this for the first time ever, and you want to play it for them so that they remember this for the rest of their lives. You're also going to be playing this for someone who this will be the last time that they hear this piece. And so let this be the the memory, mm. you know, that they hear. And I always think wow. that's such a – there's so much – involved with that and so i'm talking to him and his eyes are know, lighting up like, ah. and he's you know he's, he's thinking about that and uh i think that's kind of the the power of music yes. too right i mean music does so much to us it it ignites our memory it ignites our emotions it ignites uh you know pieces of our body you know when you get goosebumps yeah. when you you know when you hear a french horn hit a note that just you didn't expect to hear yeah it's, it's just, just amazing very, very primal it, yes it's been a while since i've seen as any symphony uh concert anywhere. i've been to a few here in fargo i've uh, been to one or two in chicago um and it took me a while to realize that I was having trouble enjoying them. And I was like, why am I having trouble enjoying this? Why do I feel bored? And then one time I was in one and I closed my eyes mm. and I just listened. Mm-hmm. I didn't watch. And I realized that was what I wasn't, that I was focusing incorrectly. I was thinking of it like a play and for my own personal enjoyment, right. just watching them play wasn't the thing that was doing it for me. But once I was able to, basically cut out the visual stimulus and then just focus on the music and be present in that moment, suddenly I thought, oh, oh. this is it. Well, and that's such an unfamiliar thing for us to do as human beings because yeah. we're so wired visually. And that really played into actually this concert because we're going to have images projected on a screen above the musicians for this concert because of the pieces. We're doing a Suite from Game of Thrones. We're doing uh, music from Lord of the Rings. And then we're doing uh, two pieces from the classical repertoire. Uh, but both also tell a story of a hero or whatever. Sharka, about a woman warrior who leads an uprising of women against the men uh, in ancient Czechoslovakia. And a uh, piece by Sibelius, Four Tales of the Kalevala. That's their big folk tradition um, tales. Uh it's called the Lemminkainen Suite. It's like four movements of this kind of bumbling guy named Lemminkainen. Um, so we had long discussions about 
the minute you give people something to look at, it, it draws your attention away from the music. And if you think of the experience of going to a movie, me as a musician, I almost have to remind myself to be conscious of the musical score because it's just there. Mm -hmm. It's adding to the experience, but it's not something you focus on. It actually heightens your experience of what you're seeing. And so it's like, where is that balance between wanting to keep the attention still on the music, but realizing, well, in the first two cases, the music was written as an accompaniment to what you're seeing. In the other two, the music was the storyteller. So we actually are going to have fewer images okay. that just stay up there longer. So you have a little context, but you listen for the action in the in the music. Mm -hmm. But we also have long conversations about this as a symphony orchestra, not just the Fargo-Moorhead Symphony, but in our industry right right <laughs> you know because it's it's an old-fashioned thing it's it seems kind of frozen in time there are people that are dressed in tuxedos and and long black dresses and the reason for that is it's uniform and it's not distracting i mean the whole theory behind how orchestras look on stage is to not provide a distraction so it's intentionally boring right but that is becoming less and less and less of the human experience in the 20th and 21st century. Right. So so, Greg so how do we adjust? Greg Carlson and I made a documentary a few years ago about Dean Syme. Um, oh, uh, I remember when he, oh, when we were first starting our recording studio, he had just like started his record shop okay. and he would always stock all the independent stuff. And what a cool guy. Right. Is he he's, still around he's, here? He's amazing. Yeah. So he he's an electrician by trade, but he runs the um, Fargo, annual Fargo vinyl uh uh, festival that happened or fair. What, fair. What, uh, it's the Fargo <laughs> Record Fair. There we go. Thank you for for saying that correctly for me. So before I met Dean, I wasn't someone who was collecting or listening to vinyl because I just I was a generation a little bit after that. Yeah. And I never thought I would be interested in it. And then when I met Dean and got to know Dean and went to his listening room <laughs> where he keeps his his primary collection and that's where he goes and he sits. And he's got a chair for it and these big speakers. And he goes and he sits and he just listens. Right? He doesn't, he's not on his phone. He's not reading a book. He goes and says, what am I listening to tonight? And watching him and how much joy he got out of being that intentional mm. about the listening he was mm -hmm. doing mm. made me go, gosh, I feel like I'm missing something. And so I started getting into vinyl collecting um, after that. And ev like about once a week, at least once a week, I, w I should do it more. I go, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to listen to something and mm. I'm going to be intentional about it. Mm -hmm. And I realized that was the same thing I was feeling when I was closing my eyes at the symphony yeah. was I am making an intentional choice to focus on this one thing. And so um, I guess that leads me into my next question I wanted to ask you about because early on you said that you're a music nerd. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that you have a collection as well at home? Like what would be in your home listening collection? Or do you just like the live stuff? I don't stuff? even have a stereo. Oh, really? <laughs> really? Um, That's almost not, more interesting. Not anymore. I I don't really listen to music for enjoyment. What? Isn't that weird? Yeah. I have been around it so much. Um, I mean, I love music. And when I'm working at my desk, I always have NPR going. And it's I I never used to listen to music while I work. Because part of my attention is always pulled to it. I can't not listen to it if it's on. Uh, but I've discovered as I get older, and I don't know, maybe my ADD is getting worse, but it keeps me focused because otherwise, you know, maybe it's giving my brain two things to do because mm -hmm. it's not satisfied with just one. And I, I always kind of play a game and see if I can identify the, if I'm listening to the radio in my car, uh, NPR, I'm always trying to see how close I can come to what what century is it? What composer is it? What piece is it? So so that's that's cool. Um, it's like back when we had the recording studio and we worked with music day in and day out, and we the we never took vacations. You know, maybe we would do a, a weekend in the Twin Cities. People say, "Oh, what bands did you go to listen to? And did you go to the opera? Did you go to the symphony?" It's like, nope, we went to a football game and a comedy club. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> And so when I'm home, I'm watching Food Network. I'm reading a book. I'm, I'm not listening to music for enjoyment. Um, What's the age old saying of the shoemaker's 
kids go without yeah. shoes, right? It's, right. Or in the in Seinfeld, you know, he's dating that masseuse. Yeah, so he thinks I mean, he's gonna get all these massages. Well, that's the like, last nope. thing they want to do. There's hardly any improv happening at your house when you no, go home. No, no, there is not none. none. <laughs> um, I'm I'm curious to know. Uh, what it's like in the world of a nonprofit nowadays. You know, we touched on it briefly that there's so many places going for that same dollar yep. nowadays, but there's also a lot of great collaboration that can take place. So I think of things like teaming up with uh, Theater B mm-hmm. for a special presentation. Yeah, we've done that or, a few times. Uh, you know, just all the all the other things that are available now that weren't. You know, when mm-hmm. you were here in the mid nineties, uh, doing this doing the same job, it's not the same job because now there's doors that were open uh, that have been opened that previously had been shut. Right. You know, it's <clears throat> excuse me. It's it's kind of a. <clears throat> It's been interesting to be able to be at the same organization two different times. So in the 90s, we were still doing collaborations with other arts groups. I remember we did things with uh, Red River Dance at the time and 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 that and choirs and the opera company and different things and, and, and things that are not arts organizations. We've done some kind of different stuff. Um, it's easier to reach people now with social media and email and all that stuff. I remember when I was at the symphony the first time, I mean, we didn't even have a website. I mean, that, mm. that all has come since I started in this job, but that means it's that much harder to rise above the clutter. How do you differentiate yourself when there's more, 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 more stuff? And in, in a modern digital age, when what you do is the opposite of that. How do you recreate that experience or how do you pull people in? All, all those things. Um, but I still subscribe to the notion that the more people are, um, whether they're fragmented or, the, or they're tied closer together through social media outlets and, and being online and, and having the screen in front of you, there still is a hunger for the genuine experience. And I've told my board many times, I want to be the NDSU bison of this arts community. <laughs> I want to mm. be the ticket that you really have to have. And so there's nothing high tech necessarily about a bison football game. It's people cooking over fire, drinking beer in the morning, going in and watching kids just knock themselves out <laughs> in pursuit of excellence. And that is exhilarating. Yeah. And I think that's people are still hungry for those genuine human beings striving for the best right in front of you experiences. Oh boy. Does that mean we're gonna start tailgating at symphony events? We well, we now have beverage service in the hall and we were the organization that changed NDSU's official presidential policy about that. Oh, tell You're us. You're welcome. Tell us about it. <laughs> yeah. That had to have been an interesting... Come to the uh, symphony. Get your drink on. Get your drink on. You can even uh, order a drink in advance, and it's ready for you nice. at intermission. Do you nice. have specialty themed drinks? Do you Sometimes. Have, you know, like the, oh, enjoy the the violin. You know, it's uh, the violin martini. And, or some Jaeger. <laughs> Just Jaeger. <laughs> Sax and violence. <laughs> oh, I want you guys to bring one. back Star Wars and pizza weekends because I did those as a kid. Oh, the pizza pop concerts. Oh yeah, those Star Wars pizza and pop. Yeah, 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 that was fun. That was fun. Yep. Are, do you get a lot of uh, suggestions from people? Like, do people ever come in and be like, Linda, I got a crazy idea for you. Yes. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, yeah. And then something gets just uh, amazingly born from that. Sometimes, yeah. I drove down to the Twin Cities. To listen to their symphony play alongside Jurassic Park this last a year? A lot of, uh, of symphonies are doing that. It's a big ticket deal. So you have to have a big hall where you can have a lot of people um, and people willing to, I, I think in order for that to be financially feasible, it's it's a big ticket kind oh, of yeah. a show. I, I, it, I spent more money than I was really excited to spend <laughs> for that. And, you know, there are a lot of people pushing us to do that. And I think it's going to be... We maybe we have to wait until the new Performing Arts Center gets built in downtown Fargo for that oh. to be a reality for us to do mm. those kinds of shows. So can we segue into this? I believe we you're can. on that committee, I aren't am. you? I'm on that uh, task force. So how are things going? 
Um, real money has been spent by the city of Fargo to hire some consultants to do some of the original uh, feasibility study type work. We just had a meeting where they reported back. They're looking at different sites and, and uh, you know, just laying some of that planning groundwork. But there is serious support for it. The next sta- stage of study, uh, we have meetings scheduled out through the spring. You know, down the road is going to be the big one, which is the financial feasibility study and finding out which revenue streams is it going to take for something like this to happen. Uh, but there's serious support for it, and I think we all are going to be keeping in mind how do we make this project happen without, you know, <laughs> hoovering up all of the dollars in town that normally go to keep organizations like mine afloat. Correct. You know, it it can't. We can't take a hit in order to get a haul. You know, we're we're struggling as everybody is as it is. So it's going to be. It's going to take some creativity to get the right revenue stream, plus, you know, donations, naming rights, all those pieces are, are part of it. And it also has to be affordable for groups. You know, you can't have this beautiful hall that you can't afford to perform in. Right. So it's, um, I'm happy to be on that task force because I'm the person with the most experience at that table in understanding that sector. So I heard a great term uh, called in addition to giving. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that you don't stop your regular giving. You give in addition to what you're currently giving. And that's what the financial feasibility study is going to accomplish. They'll interview lots of, of folks in town, including potential lead donors. And they understand, uh, you know, somebody who's contemplating a gift of that size, they understand that. Right. Um, I'm curious. So uh, the size of this, does it fluctuate? I mean, do we have a firm idea of what we want? Or is it sort of, if this is the location we choose, this is kind of what we're going to go for, that this location yeah, will the, change with the this? The size, the seating capacity is not site dependent. The seating capacity is going to be determined by interviewing all the user groups. And right there, this is another reason I'm thankful that I'm on this group, because you have groups with utterly opposite needs Mm -hmm. that will be using this same space. You have a show that Jade Presents is going to bring in. He might want three to 4,000 seats and an absolutely dead space because they're bringing their own sound you know, sure. equipment. Or and then, removable seats for the first like 15, 20 rows. I'm sure yep, it was a request that yep, he put yep, in there. Yep, whatever. And then you have the symphony, the opera, where we don't want that many seats. We'd be thrilled with a 1,500 seat hall, uh, 2,000 maybe at most, but with some capacity to maybe close off a balcony or something. And we need a live space, a reverberant space. And so the thing that I keep reminding people is, we have spaces all over town designed specifically for their purpose. We have the Fargo Dome, which is a great football stadium, and that's its purpose and, and all-purpose you know, type of stadium. And we, it's not a great live musical venue. No, it's not. And uh, bless and it wasn't them for trying. Yeah, but bl- it wasn't meant to be. Bless we them have for the trying. Fargo Theater, which is perfect for what it is intended to be, a movie theater and a performing space for 800 people. Um, we have the Shields Arena, which is a great ice hockey venue. We, have, But what we do not have in this town on any campus or anywhere is a space designed for for acoustic performance. You know, the the concert hall at NDSU, we're very happy to be there and they're wonderful to work with, but it's a dead room. We're using artificial enhanced reverb, which is a Band-Aid. It's difficult for the musicians to hear each other on the stage because, you know, we need a concert hall. You know, Jade has umpteen venues he can book. We have one need for one type of space. So we cannot lose sight of that as we're moving forward with this performance hall. Well, and I hope you guys are taking some cues too from touring theater companies and saying like, well, what are our needs for this? Mm-hmm. I remember seeing Annie at the Gate City Bank Theater up in the Fargo Dome. And I was talking to one of their road hands afterwards and I'm like, 
you know, Miss Hannigan's office was just a desk. That seemed a little lackluster. He goes, they don't have a fly system. Yeah, yeah. So we can't bring something, you know, we can't bring this. And he goes, most of the shows that are here are all pared down because of the technical sure. needs for what we have. Well, and they're making do in mm-hmm. a football arena. Um so this place absolutely will be designed with a fly space. That's kind of the preliminary things we're looking at. And it will have to have some sort of adjustable acoustical properties. I mean, there mm-hmm. are now so many improvements that have been made over the years. You know, the Festival Concert Hall was built in the 70s as a multi-purpose space. But now the kinds of, of things with panels and movable this, that, and the other, um, different kinds of materials, absorptive or reflective you can you can do some pretty amazing things. So, yeah, so that Gate City series would absolutely find a home in this uh, new performing arts space. I uh, I went to Carnegie Hall for the first time ever uh, a couple of years ago. I've never been there. It is, I mean, you I walk in there. I haven't practiced enough. Oh, oh. there's another one. Oh, stop it. <laughs> uh, you can really feel you feel history when you walk sure. in there. Same way I felt like when I walked into Second City for the first time ever. Oh my like goodness. you feel you feel the history. And one thing I noticed about Carnegie Hall was just when you're in I took a tour before seeing a show that evening. Oh, and fun. when you, when you take the tour, you realize, you know, when this thing was built, the limitations that were available to them when they first built it are there, but they found ways to tweak it and make those changes as time goes on. It's kind of like the dressing rooms at the Fargo Theater. I mean, it, you, yeah. you feel yes. the history oh, in their yeah. little bitty dressing rooms, but it's like, who came through these rooms? Right. Yeah. You think of like, you know, members uh, members of KISS have been yep. here. Radar the, O'Reilly has been here. have probably done a ton of making out in those rooms in the past <laughs> sure, couple of years, right? right? So I'm very That's excited. Scandalous. Except for Tim. Nice Tim's boys. not doing what any making out. About? <laughs> They're very nice boys. They're very good at making out. <laughs> Tim, Tim's the only one who lis- of the blenders who listens to this I podcast. I just think like, so. if, if Tim's making out with someone, he's also probably criticizing it at the same time. Like, I'd like his hand, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. And he's a little <laughs> lipstick on his hand and he kisses that. Yeah, right, right. And he's like, no, you got to do it like that. I'll yeah. just take care of it myself. Yeah. You, you go on. Um, <laughs> Linda's like, I don't. What yeah, did I get into? Off the rails here. <laughs> we, when we, when Tucker and I worked at the Fargo Theater, the Blenders were our favorite group to oh, come yeah. in because those guys have so much fun. Um, have you guys ever teamed up with the Blenders? No. Mm, there you go. There there's, you go. There's a, maybe a 2020 project for you. There I mean, that's definitely an, a Fargo institution. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I remember when they were them. just starting up in the little room at. Red River Dance. They yep. get in there. JJ's with family's it. pretty connected to Blender's history. Mm-hmm. Oh. We are, yeah. In fact, uh, one of their first paying gigs was at my sister's second birthday party. Oh my and goodness! And we've got a great video. I keep telling Tim that if he doesn't keep giving me uh, good seats, I'm going to release <laughs> onto the internet the video. Um, with with the other people who are on this task force, and I'm sorry to keep coming back to this, That's but I, that was one of the reasons I was really excited to talk to you today. Um, do, is there an understanding that like time is of the essence with this, and this isn't something that can get just kind of pushed to, you know, five, ten years down the road? You know, it's road? funny uh, when we got the report from the uh, consultants. You know, our group had actually made a formal motion to we're going to look at this site. Let's quit talking about this, that, and the other thing. It's not really viable. And so then we saw the consultants and, well, we're looking at these sites and next time we'll show you. And there were like eye rolls around the tables like, come on. So I think this group really does want to move forward, which is very encouraging. Um, Where I got involved in this particular aspect of it, it was a really interesting conversation that was being had about a year ago with downtown business leaders. And at the time, Brad Wimmer was on our board, and he was one of the informal organizers of this group with a lot of kind of the the main downtown folks. And their purpose was to discuss a convention center and get a consensus or get a recommendation for a preference for having it downtown. So they were meeting regularly and talking about this, and Brad was mentioning to me, he said, you know, we're having these meetings to talk about the convention center, but a performing arts center keeps coming up. Why don't you just come to these meetings? <laughs> I'm like, okay. So we started uh, continuing these conversations, and I my jaw would drop because as the weeks went by and the conversations kept circling, the consensus that came out of this group 
And these are some people who have maybe been eye rollers in the past when the subject of the arts comes up and needs and so forth. They said, you know, we should just do the Performing Arts Center first. That's really the low-hanging fruit. I'm like, what? What? When did a Performing Arts Center <laughs> get to be like, okay, that's the slam dunk? Yeah, this like, other thing. Like, why are I don't uh, know. you know? It's it, we could do. We could pull the lever anytime we wanted. Yeah, no like, big deal. Wow, have times changed? So knowing, and and I'm looking around the table, and I'm thinking, what happened to you over there? You know, just hearing that sentiment from some of those individuals was amazing to me. And it's like, wow, we have changed as a community in a in a good way. It's like this is. I never thought I would uh, hear that conversation, but that really demonstrated to me where this community is now and its understanding of the role that that plays. Because every one of those guys was sitting around not just saying, boy, I'd sure like to donate some more money. They're all thinking, boy, I'd sure like to make some more money. And a performing arts center downtown is how we're going to do it. So it's fantastic. It really is. So I consider myself pretty fiscally conservative. Sure. And I see the value of a performing arts center to businesses. Oh, absolutely. To tourism. Uh, I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. I think that there's a real idea that, well, you know, North Dakota is, we're legendary, right? We're all about cowboys. Unfortunately, that's not what we're attracting in Fargo. That might be great for the western side of the state. Right. But for us, we need to be able to tell people, like, this is a metropolitan area. And you can come and you can get culture. You can go see the Symphony Rocks out of Blue Stem. You can uh, stay in one of our amazing hotels. You can eat at some amazing restaurants. Yep. But the amount of stuff that we're missing every year by not having a performing arts center Absolutely. like that. I think about this. Jerry Seinfeld twice has been to Grand Forks at the Chester Fritz because he's they don't think they can sell out the dome, but they also know they can sell more tickets in the Fargo Theater. Sure. And so yeah. where's that, that sweet in spot. between? Yep. I mean, I've we seen Jim Gaffigan fill the Civic Center, and I've seen George Carlin fill the Civic Center. I mean, I'm surprised that Seinfeld wouldn't just go there, I guess. But but the Civic Center, it's, man, that's a tired facility. Yeah, you that's know, true. Maybe it seats two to 3,000, but oof. You know, those same seats in a beautiful concert hall. You know, it's, it's true. I've seen some some acts in Theater Row at uh, Minneapolis, the Pentages or, you know, one mm -hmm. of those places. You feel like you're inside a wedding cake. It's just beautiful. Yeah. You know, it's just one of those historic theater theaters. And so this will be a modern version of that, of course. But you're going to an event in a proper facility. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, I remember having uh, a discussion with the developer in 2000 six that wanted to do the hockey arena downtown, the cityscapes development. You remember mm -hmm. that vote mm -hmm. and everything? And I was one of the lonely no holdouts because man, everyone was getting on that bandwagon and the the chamber and the you know business leaders, everyone was pushing hard for this. And so um they actually <laughs> they actually sicked Ed Schultz on me. Uh, they thought, well, he's a liberal. He'll change her mind. So they stuck us in an office. And we were like knee to knee. And he was like just yelling at me. And I, I kept saying, you can yell at me all you want, but I don't think this is feasible. I don't think it's right for downtown. And so that didn't work. But um, the developer, who's who's a good guy, um, was showing me the, the drawings. And it's this arena. It ended up to be, of course, the Shields mm -hmm. Arena out there, which is a perfect place for it. Um, but he said, you know, we could do musical events in here. And he had this whole presentation to try to soften me up that you know, you, the symphony could perform in here. And I was feeling like I was not getting through to him. And I finally said, <laughs> you know, the, the, the question is what a facility, what its purpose is. You know, you're talking about a hockey arena. I finally looked at him and said, could I eat a gourmet dinner in my bathroom? Sure. But is that the place for it? <laughs> right. That's a good point. Oh, anyway, oh, okay. Also, to, to constantly... I'm the wrong person to say that, too, though. There's a lot of things happen in my bathroom. <laughs> okay. Again. <laughs> 
It's constantly it's pizza. Is, is, is your, is I your eat, mic still on? I eat chicken strips in the shower. <laughs> Stop it. You I do, do not. The I breading do. would wash right off. No, because there's so much <laughs> empty space in the shower still, JJ, where water isn't hitting, and you leave the plate on the outside. No, no. I Shenanigans. I'll videotape it <laughs> and find out if this is true. Uh, I don't like the idea of, of or arts organizations being an afterthought to things like yeah. a hockey arena. Like, right. well, it's a hockey arena, but we can also do this with it. Well, you know, no, no, they're, thank they're you. They're not ice skating in a concert hall, right? Well, and the economic so, models are different. Just because, absolutely, bo- just because both require spectators doesn't mean that it's the same experience, right? So the the venue being proper to the and man, talk about venues. I am now a hockey fan, by the way. I'm not that much of a snob. Yep, and there's yeah. nothing wrong. I, I go have to nothing the, against sports now. Now that um, I am married to someone who is an insane UND hockey fan. Um, and I go to those hockey, that, boy, you want to talk about a facility designed and built for its purpose. Mm-hmm. It's oh, yeah. gorgeous. The it's Ralph amazing. Is gorgeous. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. And it also so, gets nice and loud and you feel yeah. a real great oh, energy in there. It's, it's fantastic. So anyway, I am hopeful that this thing will keep going forward and it's going to be a beautiful, fabulous space for this region. I'm very, very excited about it. I also am a big fan of not losing part of our creative class because we're mm-hmm. not providing the opportunities that mm-hmm. they need. So, you know, I think of like, well, if the symphony didn't exist, would we be able to hold on to some of those musicians who they who you have playing with you? Or is it the idea of, well, I, I'm teaching right now and I like teaching, but I also need to do something to fulfill my own soul and Absolutely. continue my own uh, background. So then they move to Minneapolis or they move to Chicago where mm-hmm. the opportunities can be brighter. So if we can do everything we can to retain that creative class. Absolutely. And that ha- that helps. Uh, everything is connected. You, our talent pool is a result of having three high quality music departments at the three colleges and universities. Uh, but even more so, the symphony gets used all the time. Uh, it's kind of like seeing the Fargo Theater logo on everything. Uh, the symphony gets used all the time in recruitment and retention by large companies, you know. Mm. So when they're trying to recruit professionals to come to Fargo and live here and raise a family here, they'll talk about safe neighborhoods, great schools, and thriving arts community. Yes, we have a symphony orchestra and a dance company and an opera company. And, oh, really? Okay. So, you know, we are an asset to the business community and the professional community. So, you know, I think the more that uh, our community understands that, and like I say, I think that's reflected in the conversations that we're having about this proposed performing arts facility will continue to thrive. I do think that the arts sector in Fargo-Moorhead has not uh, realized the same growth that Fargo has as a community and a business community. I mean, the business community in Fargo-Moorhead is just, thriving it's it's blossoming and we haven't really seen a slice of that yet i think we have to get somehow those revenue streams making a difference you know so that we can keep up and keep our artistic level high as well i think there's a certain amount of uh a weight that we need to put on the shoulders of private citizens mm-hmm. um, to say you need to step up like some previous gen- generations. And it's great that you can slap your name on something, but also you need to do things just because you know the community needs it and it's going to better serve everybody for it. I think of the people like Ruth Landfield. Oh, my goodness, yes. Who lived at the end of my block and was somebody who, my goodness, she understood what it meant Athens on the Prairie. That was right. her slogan. Yes. Um, I like that. I've never heard that before. Yeah. Oh, Athens yeah. on the Prairie. <laughs> and I think that there's just, there's a chance and the younger people, I'm also a big fan of, you know, the millennial generation mm-hmm. was forgotten for a while as a do- as a donor base because they thought, well, you know, these are the young kids and they're more interested in their AirPods than they are in, in giving. But Well, I mean, you guys are burdened with more student debt than we ever Imagine, unless yeah. you didn't too. go to college. <laughs> hey, there you go. In which case, it's probably credit card debt then. <laughs> nope, um, <laughs> not so, even that. You know, to me, I think part of it is like, let's not. You know, don't forget, everybody has the potential, and even if they can't write that thousand dollar check, 
uh, on Giving Hearts Day, they can get a hundred dollars out there. Well, and, they and can absolutely, and I, I think the energy in that group is fantastic. We're very intentional about trying to cultivate those next generations as a symphony orchestra too. We have a group for a program for people in their 20s and 30s called Urban Overture. And so every Wednesday of concert week, Wednesday we actually have don't have rehearsal, uh, we have a free event for people in their 20s and 30s at the Radisson, free wine tasting, free hors d'oeuvres, um, kind of a networking event. And Chris will talk about the upcoming concert and we'll either have the guest artists come in and play something. So it's very intimate, but you've got, you know, like an international guest artist playing their instrument right for you. And you can get uh, a code to get $10 tickets to the concert instead of $38 tickets. So we have, I think, our uh, membership base is free to join. We just gather your information and your email address. I think we have over 500 people wow. On that list, that's and awesome. So we had, I'm going to sign up after this. Yes, you should be there. So ever, I think I've Facebook invited you to I think Urban you Overture have. in the I past. Think you have. Uh, but yeah, we we tend to get about 60, 70 people. We kind of pack the place, and it's great. It it's become a uh, networking opportunity. We we've seen some people become regulars, but there's always new new folks discovering it, and and it's fun, and it's just just for them. So. Then when Giving Hearts Day rolls around, you know, those people, uh, younger adults, they feel connected to the symphony. It's it's their symphony. They get to dress, get dressed up on date night and have that experience. And so they'll volunteer at our events. They'll give us a few bucks on Giving Hearts Day. And as our industry has researched, you get someone in their either if they've played an instrument in their youth and they can identify with it, they start going to concerts when they're young and it becomes part of their life. Maybe we'll, we'll see them disappear during kind of the blur years of having young kids. But when, when their kids are older, they'll come back and then they will right. be that next generation of really supporting patrons. So we're making a big investment. Um, but we love having them in the concert hall. Now we've had a couple uh, marriages and a baby or two come out of that group. Nice. Yeah. So there you go. So if you're single and looking yes. to mingle, Urban Overture. <laughs> and and it forces you to mingle because, you know, the seating is limited. So you say, may I join your table? And oh, that's boom, swell. Bam, bam. There you go. So, uh, Linda, as we wrap this yes. up, if people want to know more about the symphony or more, even more about what you're doing, is sure. there a way that they can find you on the Internet? Yep, absolutely. FMSymphony.org. Oh, that's easy. It is easy. Yeah. And then uh, you've got information, obviously, about shows, guest artists, yep. uh, how people can give and get involved if Absolutely. they're interested in that. And then uh, I suppose it's also a great place to reach out if you've got one of those wild and wacky ideas, yes, too. Yes, that would be a real treat. Yeah, just our offices are downtown. We're just, I like to say, we're just south of Nicole's in the uh, WTAY Tower. So <laughs> oh, there you go. Come pay us a visit. Well, thank you very much, Linda Boyd, Thanks, for being a guest this on JJ a Meets World. Ton of fun. <laughs> A huge thanks to Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Realty for sponsoring this podcast. Folks, if you're looking to buy or sell a home, contact Natalie Deutsch today because Natalie Deutsch is not only a previous podcast guest, she's somebody who's going to care enough to sell your property for top dollar. She's also going to find you the best price possible if you're purchasing a new home. Last year on average, Natalie earned her clients $4,000 over list price on their homes and sold them faster than the market average. On average, Natalie's selling a home every 3.74 days. That's two homes a week. Those numbers don't lie. Find out why Natalie is one of the top agents in this entire market. Get a hold of her today, Natalie at HatchRealtyFM.com. You can also call 701-388-9338 or go on to LiveFargoMoorhead.com. That's LiveFargoMoorhead.com. Read all of her amazing reviews and then listen to her episode of JJ Meets World. Thanks again to Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Realty. That's going to wrap it up for today's show. If you enjoyed this episode of JJ Meets World and would like to help us continue to produce two new episodes every week, you can donate to our Patreon. Check out patreon.com slash JJ Meets World and donate today. Even as little as a dollar a month can go a long way. Visit our website at www.jjmeetsworld.com or hit up our social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, 
all the sites the kids are using these days. If you'd like to stay up to date on new episodes of JJ Meets World, you can find us on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, or wherever you consume the podcast that you love. JJ Meets World is produced every week by Tucker Lucas. You can find out more about Tucker's work by checking out www.moonbasemaria.com. If you want to get in touch with your host with the most, go to linebenders.com and you can find direct contact info for JJ. Uh, it's with a sad heart that we let our listeners know that uh, our number one fan, Silvermine Sal, recently died in a mine collapse. Um, he's 118 years old, and uh, he'll be missed. We have his canaries in the studio now, and oh god. Ah!